Welcome to the Uncharted Podcast. I am your host, Inez Franklin. My hope for you today is that we discover faith beyond the boundaries. Uncharted is intended to be a safe place for you to listen, learn, and challenge yourself along your journey of faith. May grace and peace be with you today. Welcome to the show. friends. Thank you for joining me to the Uncharted Podcast. Today, we're going to be interviewing Dr. Sharon Hadi Miller. She is a teaching pastor at Bright City Church in Durham, North Carolina, which she co-founded with her husband, Ike. She is the author of three books, uh, Free of Me and Nice. And we're going to talk about her third book in our podcast here called The Cost of Control, Why We Crave It, The Anxiety It Gives Us, and The Real Power That God Gives. In fact, we're not just going to talk about it today, but we have decided to make this a five-part series. Today is an introduction, and then we'll have four more podcasts that are going to cover this important topic. Because listen, who does not struggle with control, right? Now, let me tell you a little bit more about her. Uh, She has blogged for uh, SheWorships.com for over 10 years. She's been a regular contributor to Propel, Hermeneutics, and She Reads Truth. And she's also written for Relevant and Christianity Today, Encourage, and many other publications and blogs. So she's a great thinker, obviously someone who's very thoughtful with her words. And as you'll see, she is very relatable and she speaks from her heart, from her own experience. So I think we're going to learn a lot. Now, the format for this podcast is simply a conversation. So the next podcast you'll see, we're just having a conversation about this topic of control because it affects all of us. And it produces a great deal of anxiety, but control is also something that helps us with survival. So like, what is the right balance of this and what are really we to do with this issue of control? So I'm so glad you joined us. I think you'll be enriched by this conversation. I was super excited when I saw her book come out. I thought we need to have a conversation. It so connects with my current journey of writing my book on the uncharted journey of faith. And so I hope you enjoy it and I hope you'll join us for the rest of the podcast. Remember to share it with your friends. Make sure they sign up on the email list so they will be notified as soon as the next podcast is published and then you won't miss a thing. So share it with others and thank you for joining us again. Let's get started. Well, Sharon, thank you so much for joining us today. I am so excited to talk to you about your book, to go deeper. Um, Yeah, as we were preparing for this call, I'm even more excited because we're not just going to talk about your book today, but we're going to sort of set up this this longer conversation about your the topic that you're you have written about and that you're passionate about. So, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm excited to be with you. So, I know you you've talked about this in other podcasts, but don't assume that readers, you know, listening to this one as well, but yeah, just tell us how you came through this topic of control. And Mm -hmm. and to write about it. Um, Yeah, the the journey you took to get here. Yeah, I came to it a a little bit differently than you might expect. Like a number of interviews I've done, people say, you know, when did you know you were a control freak? And I say, well, I didn't. That's not why I wrote this book. Like if you had asked me three years ago if I thought I was a control freak, I would have said no. If if you'd asked me three years ago if I struggled with control, I would have said not really. I just never saw myself as that that being like a thing that I struggled with. The way I came at it was through really the pandemic and watching how the folks in our church were responding and watching how Christians online were responding and seeing that the pandemic exposed this idolatry of certainty and predictability and control. And despite the fact that we are heirs to literally millennia, you know, of spiritual resources, you know, handed down to us by, you know, earlier Christians and by the word of God and Jesus himself, you know, we can read scripture and see that they lived through pandemics. They lived through plagues, through wars, you know, through all sorts of things and drew on 
you know, the peace of Christ to confront it, you know, for, for Paul to be able to say, you know, that you can rejoice always and you can have peace in all circumstances. And we are very clearly not bearing witness to that in our response <laughs> to the pandemic. And so I'm watching all of this and thinking, okay, this is exposing what's going on in the lives of our people. This is exposing a gap in discipleship. And so thinking, okay, how do I want to address this in our church, you know, more broadly in my my teaching as well. But I also know that my best writing comes not from standing over people and sort of pointing to their sin, but speaking out of my own sin. I really, I think that's when I write the most honestly and truthfully is out of my own personal conviction. And so somewhere along the way, I really can't remember when I started to ask the question, well, is this something that I struggle with? And shockingly, yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> but I Whoops. just, I had not, I think when I thought of someone who struggles with control, I had seen it very differently. Like I know a lot of people who are very, very anxious because they are, they really wrestle with wanting to control things. You know, they, most recently, my kids are little, they're all in elementary school. And I have friends who, when their first child started kindergarten, it was like they're losing sleep. I mean, they are just anxious to the max over wanting to control every little detail of where are my kids going to go to school, you know, which school is going to be the best one for them, all, you know, just wanting to control all these things. And I didn't wrestle with that. When my kids went to kindergarten, I was like, bye. You know, it was not, (laughs) you know, I, I just wasn't wrestling with it. And so I really saw myself as being very chill and not wrestling with control. But it turns out control plays out in a lot of different ways. And that was the really convicting epiphany of this journey was realizing, oh, I I actually do wrestle with control and it is affecting my relationships. I just never noticed. Wow. Okay. So I have a number of questions. So going back a little bit, you talked about our, our church fathers, our patriarchs who maybe demonstrated a different kind of posture towards uh, desire for control or whatever made them anxious. So it got me thinking, um, did they, in other words, like, um, were they less controlling that we are today? Mm-hmm. Really? Because I, what I'm thinking I really like about your book is you, you are using Genesis one, two, three as the, the platform of this conversation. I think you mentioned it at the end of the book, you talk about like, this is a reflection on these passages, right? Mm-hmm. And so is is your book written for modern day control freaks mm-hmm. or is it written for the human problem of control? Both and would be mm-hmm. the answer to that question because I, that's a really great question because I think we can look back on early Christians and really romanticize them and say, you know, the early church, like they really had it down. They really knew what they were doing until you read 1 Corinthians and then yeah. they're a hot <laughs> steaming garbage pile. You know, they're they're a mess because yeah. they're just as human as we are. And so that has not changed at all. And so to the extent that they are human and we are human, nothing has changed. They did they did struggle with control because this is the human condition. You know, the moment mm-hmm. when sin entered the world in Genesis 3 is the moment when Adam and Eve decide that they don't want boundaries on their lives, that they want to have more power, more authority, more knowledge than God has granted them. And so every time we reach for control, we are reenacting that moment again and again, and we're sort of doomed to. that. That's what happened when sin entered the world is it, it sort of rewrote creation in a way where all of Adam and Eve's descendants are sort of doomed to struggle with this. So we're no different from them in that sense. They, of course, struggled with control. They struggled with wanting to control other people. What is different and what has changed is our culture. They lived in a culture where they were confronted with their lack of control much more regularly 
than yeah. we are. And that's because of our technology. As our technology grows, you know, modern medicine, the internet, Comforts. smartphones, yeah, whatever it is, we are gradually constructing this illusion of control that does give us some greater mastery over the world. I mean, the the advances in modern medicine is not an illusion. You know, the the age of, you know, death or whatever is like grow- people live longer than ever. You know, people right. were able to heal things that they would have never imagined. You know, there, there are so many ways where we do have more predictability, more influence than before. But by and large, I think technology encourages us to overestimate our mastery over the world. And to it, it sort of lulls us into this false sense of control that we can sort of retreat into. And one of the costs of that, you know, the, the title of the book is The Cost of Control. And there's a lot of different costs. But one cost is an atrophied faith. Because mm-hmm. whenever we're faced with uncertainty, whenever we're faced with something that that feels out of control, whenever we're faced with our anxiety, we have all these different illusions of control that we can run to and sort of escape into almost now more than ever. And every time we make that choice to escape into an illusion of control rather than just face reality – we are faced with the same choice. Am I going to grow my faith or am I going to lean on control, trusting control instead? And so I I think that is a a key cultural difference where we are not better or worse than the people that came before us, but we do have all this technology tempting us in a way that they did not 2000 years ago. Yeah. And it, there's so much more information that it complicates our relationship with control, because it makes Mm -hmm. one of the chapters you talk about knowledge as being one of the ways in which we control. And that is different today than Mm -hmm. than it was then. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, you say that control is a devil's deal. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's a good one. Right. And that it doesn't work the way we we think it will. Um, Yeah. And so, okay, now going back to your own journey, like figuring out, oh, I I have control issues. Um, you know, none of us want to feel like we're control freaks. Mm-hmm. I mean, right? Because we know that person that is really in that category, you know, and if we don't, then yes, we probably are. But I mean, there's always somebody that we know, they want the towels exactly in a certain way in the bathroom, you know, that movie, uh-huh. <laughs> that yes. movie, the glass house, I think it was, right? We have those people in mind. So, uh-huh. um, you know, when we, when we say control freaks, we quickly separate ourselves and go, we're not that. And uh-huh. so it sounds like that's kind of a journey you went through, like, okay, so I'm not that, but then uh-huh. what is my relationship with control, really? Uh-huh. If, mm-hmm. if it's not that, it, it is somewhere in there. So tell now, now let's go back to that. You were saying how you like to teach it from your own personal journey. Yeah. So one of the ways I realize, I mean, really, it's embarrassing when I think back on all the areas that I struggle with with control. I mean, I struggle with it in my parenting. I struggle with it in my marriage. But the the way that I first started to realize I struggled with it was actually in my leadership and pastoring our church. You mentioned that I, I have a whole section of the book where I look at different tools of control, like things that we run to to try to either exert control or to simply give us the feeling of control. And I define control in two different ways because of that. It's not just imposing your will on a situation, but also just the feeling that that we have of being in control, which can be totally disconnected from reality. But one of the chapters in that section on tools of control is knowledge and information. And this is not, at least for me, when I think about how we control my, the, the first thing I think of is power, you know, that that's what we typically associate with control. That's true. But yeah. at, at ground zero, when Adam and Eve first defy God and reach for, you know, more than he has allotted to them, more influence, really, what they're reaching for is not power, really, but knowledge, and I think that that is 
probably, I think it's fair to say that might be the number one thing that we turn to as a form of control, but also to help us feel in control. And so yeah, we all run to I, the, we, we all run to Google when we, I, yeah. I, in fact, that happened, that happened to me a few weeks ago. I woke up in the middle of the night and, and I wasn't feeling well. And my husband quickly ran to another room to Google to find out the symptoms I was having. Yeah. <laughs> what, what was I, we, we all do this. We all go to Google to find out, okay, these symptoms, what's wrong with me? <laughs> yeah, that's how yeah. you may have heard me share this story yes. before, but I had last year, I had some stomach pain and I think I shared this in one of my sermons on this. I had this stomach pain last year. And so I start Googling and because we have all this knowledge available to us, you know, more than any generation, we, we have all of the medical fields database essentially available to us because of the internet. And so that's vast knowledge. And you go to it thinking this is going to empower me and help me to feel a sense of control over this situation. But that never happens. You know, we always go to the worst possible diagnosis and think, I'm actually dying now. That's it. And then you you start <laughs> to inhabit that emotional reality. And yeah. so when I, last year when I did that and I, you know, had the stomach pain and I, you know, concluded I was basically dying. And then when I finally went to my GI doctor and told her my conclusion, she didn't say, no, it's probably not that. She she didn't say, don't worry. You know, all she said to me was get off the internet. They probably and spend so, most of their time dealing with people coming to them with doctors. pages, pages from yes. the internet. Look, I figured out what's wrong with me. You all your job is just to give me the medicine because I yeah, already figured but it that's out. That's what we <laughs> do. That's how a lot of people dealt with the pandemic when it first happened yeah. is we were all on the internet, just scrolling, 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 researching, trying to find out everything we could. And so we all brought our fears to the internet instead of to God. And yeah. it did not yield peace because that's not what knowledge does. It doesn't produce in us security and stability. You know, it enlightens us, it teaches us, it guides us, but it cannot do that which only Jesus can do. And so that's one way that we turn to knowledge for this sense of control in our lives. But we also use it to control other people. And that's what I was doing in my leadership when we were, you know, you might relate to this as a pastor as well, but when we were leading through the pandemic, Every decision that we made, we knew was going to disappoint somebody. Yeah. And I started thinking, but what if I just explain this decision to them the right way? What if I present to them all the data that we are drawing on, all the experts in our church? We had an actual infectious disease expert in our church that we were listening to to guide us. We were consulting with other pastors. And, and I kept thinking, if I can just lay out all this information just the right way and download it into their brain— that this will change their mind. And I would not have said I'm trying to control them, but that is what I was trying to do. I had this overestimation of the power of, of knowledge and information to, to change people. And because I deep down was really trying to control people and thought I could control people when they didn't change, when they didn't agree with me after that, I was like, well, what's wrong with you? You know, yeah. I've, I've given you the, the all the important data and it didn't work. So what's wrong with you? So and as so a communicator, as a communicator, <clears throat> you're obviously trying to influence people with your mm -hmm. words, right? Mm -hmm. So how would you describe the difference between influence, which mm -hmm. you are trying to drive people towards a direction, which we, I mean, that's actually pretty effective. We have... There's, there's, there's ways to, to influence people towards, some people might call it manip manipulation. And of course, the worst case scenario is controlling. How, how did you determine I was controlling them versus I was trying to influence them? Mm -hmm. A couple ways. The primary one, going back to the title, The Cost of Control, is one of the number one costs of control is anxiety. Anytime we try to control something that we cannot control, that God has not given us to control, it is going to create anxiety in so us. So the fruit, you measure it by yeah. the fruit. Yeah. And so, and, and we miss this 
we very often miss this because we are also going to control to cope with pre-existing anxiety. And so as our anxiety grows, we sort of blame the thing. Like, I'm feeling anxious because of this thing outside of myself. And that might be partially true. But what is making it much, much worse is you are now trying to control this thing and it is not submitting to you and is freaking you out. Mm -hmm. But you don't understand that you've actually gotten yourself stuck in this cycle of trying to make something to submit to you and it is refusing to. And that's anxiety inducing. And so that was a big part was, was realizing I was laying awake at night, losing hours of sleep rehashing these conversations or anticipating these conversations or thinking, how can I say it this way? And I was just racked with anxiety and stress because of this. Whereas if I had just released it and said, this is the most I can do is to steward the information that I have available to me and then present it to our people as humbly and winsomely as I can and then let it go And if I had done that, the result probably would have been the same, to be honest. It wouldn't have changed either way. But if I released it... You get some better sleep. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You know, and I I would have still had to grieve some of the pushback, but I, I would have not wasted hours of my life spinning over these conversations. And so that was a huge sign for me. How much of control is... A survival mechanism. Like, <clears throat> obviously, you're looking at this through the, G- the Genesis narrative, which mm-hmm. is not about survival, right? Mm-hmm. It was about human foolishness, really, at the end of the day. But, but, but e- today, how much mm-hmm. of this is simply survival? Like, you're trying to yeah. have your church survive, mm-hmm. and you're trying to figure out a way to unify people yeah. in a very difficult time. That's a great question, that no one has ever asked me. And I appreciate it because there's a really, I don't even know if this is what you had in mind when you asked it, but there's a chapter where I look at kind of the history of research, like psychological research onto control. And in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, he lists control as like an essential human need kind of under the section of security Food. and safety. Mm-hmm. Now, I would maybe quibble a little bit with Maslow. <laughs> if I humbly, if I would humbly. if I may be so bold, <laughs> I would quibble a little bit because what I think he is actually talking about is more agency. And and this is a distinction that I make is that God doesn't give us control over really much of anything. We have self-control, but that's really the only thing that we we truly have some control over is ourselves. So we we don't have control, but we do have agency. And we see this in Genesis 1 and 2. So before Adam and Eve defy God's boundary, they are not puppets. They're not prisoners. They're they're not robots. They actually have tremendous freedom and tremendous influence and authority and, and purpose and power. And so what they don't have is control, but I call that agency, which is a different psychological term. And it essentially means the power to influence yourself and your circumstances. And this is a basic human need. Because if you don't have agency over yourself, then you are being enslaved or you are being abused or oppressed. And so it's very, very important. I mean, this is even in, you know, conversations around mental health when someone's mind is compromised, there's still a really crucial ethical consideration of how do you still preserve the agency of a person while also intervening, you know, to maybe make Mm -hmm. decisions on their behalf. And so it's a really, you know, sacred human attribute is is having that that power to to influence yourself. But it's, it's important to make a distinction between that and control. Control is, is not the same thing. You have influence in your world, but you don't have control. And so going back to that question of, you know, what is necessary for 
survival, I think agency is is necessary, having that influence over yourself and your circumstances. But in addition to that, he has Maslow has control and safety in in the same category. But in Genesis 1 and 2, and I don't even say this in the book, but in Genesis 1 and 2, they are the most safe yes. and the most stable Provided and the most for. free that they ever, any human ever was, not because they had control. And so I think that's a really important distinction to make there. That's really good. I appreciate that. You, you talk about con- control being costly. Mm-hmm. So, right. We, we just, you know, kind of separated control and influence and agency. That's important because a lot of times we think, well, I'm supposed to be able to control some things. We, mm-hmm. we kind of address that. But, but you say control is costly. And maybe before we say the cost of it, um, define control, right? Mm-hmm. So now we, we've already separated influence, agency. Can you give us another a quick mm-hmm. definition of control? And then from there, a little bit about the cost. Yeah, so I already mentioned I define control in two ways. You know, it's uh, the power to impose your will on circumstances and people. And then it's also this feeling of empowerment that you have. But I think what you're really asking is what is the difference between agency and control? Like, how do we know when we're exercising a godly influence and when we have, you know, defied that in some way? And again, Genesis 3 is is really instructive for us because the moment they they move from agency to control is the moment when they defy this God-given limitation on their will. Mm-hmm. And that for me is a really helpful way to know when am I trying to defy the limitations that God has placed on on my power. And one way I really can tell the difference is it's the difference between influence and outcome. So I am called as a pastor to influence the people in my church. Can I control the way that they live? No, I cannot. Can I control, you know, the way that they follow Jesus? No, I cannot. Can I control how they respond to this gospel presentation that I presented? No, I cannot. I also think about this as a parent. I'm right. called to influence my children. I'm called to discipline my children, to teach them, to guide them, to disciple them. All of that great influence, great authority. But can I control if they decide to devote their lives to Christ? No, I cannot. Can I control Mm -hmm. what paths they choose for their lives? No, I cannot. And this is especially hard because my children are little right now. They are, my oldest is 10 and my youngest is four. And so it is very easy to control them (laughs) right now. How many many children do you have? Three. So they're age 10, seven, and four. And well, I should say it's actually not easy to control them at all. <laughs> but if I if I wanted if I really wanted to, you know, unleash a reign of terror on my children and make you know break their wills, yeah. I could do that. You know, do I want to? Is that good parenting? No, it, it's it's not. And so even now, there there is a dance where I'm constantly trying to discern. What does it look like to discipline them, you know, to teach them how to obey, but at the same time, honoring the limitations of my influence over them? And if I force my children to behave in a certain way in all contexts, that is not healthy parenting. And Mm -hmm. there will be a cost to it, but I won't see that cost for possibly decades. And so that is, that's a it, very, very nuanced, but those are some of the ways where that plays out in my own life. Yeah, that's good. Okay. So then tell us a little bit about the cost of control then. Mm-hmm. When we do, when we do engage in it in a way that obviously mm-hmm. is unhealthy and damaging. Yeah. So the title of this book comes from Genesis 3, where the, the whole and the book picture is, is great, by the way. I love oh, the, thank you. the beautiful picture with the fruit on the tree. Yeah, nice. thank you. <laughs> so great cover. The, the whole book is a long meditation on Genesis 3, that moment, and how we're sort of doomed to repeat it every time we reach for control. 
But in addition to repeating that moment, we also repeat its consequences. And Mm -hmm. this was really helpful for me to fully accept that there are not loopholes to this. That because this happened, again, at ground zero of sin entering the world, there is this relationship that is formed between our efforts to control and the brokenness that it will create in our lives and in the lives of the people around us. And there isn't a way around this. It it will happen even if we don't see it immediately. And that is the the really sobering takeaway is the consequences might not be immediate. And so you might think I got away with it. I was able to control this situation and I got away with it. And really you just haven't seen the cost yet. But that was really helpful for me to, to just accept that this is reality. This is the reality of our relationship with control because it reframed those situations in which I wanted to exert control. You know, when I'm in a conversation with my husband and I'm wanting to control a decision, I now think not just I shouldn't try to control him, which was not motivating to me at all. <laughs> <laughs> like just knowing that I shouldn't control him because you 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 read you you find your way to saying it's not control it's what's right this <laughs> is the right decision this is not about control or this is me being a really good debater sharing my point of view oh, yeah showing yeah. my point of like, view I'm just very being convincing a good partner. Yeah, yeah. yeah but now I'm thinking in terms of I'm trying to coerce my husband right now and I could get my way right now but it is going to cost my marriage. It is. And so is it worth it to get my way in this moment? And that was a very different question that was much more motivating to me to drop control like a hot potato. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna dive deeper into these the various costs and the various techniques that we use for control. Go even deeper, I hope, on this idea of control, influence, control, anxiety, and of course, the, 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 the back part of your book is the alternative, right? The, the promise that God gives us, the one thing we have that can release us from this. So we're going to go into that over our next podcast. But to close this one and kind of give us a hint for what's coming, um, give us a, an eye view of like, okay, what's the promise? What's the real power that we have? What is the one thing we can control that it's not going to be an unhealthy control that's going to be costly. Mm-hmm. Well, the title, the subtitle is a little bit deceptive in the sense oh. that <laughs> it sort of <laughs> do, makes do it sound do like that? <laughs> <laughs> it's it makes it sound like there's just one alternative to control when there's actually multiple. Mm-hmm. And so we've already talked about two of them, which is agency and self-control. And so those are our two powers that are available to us. And so we'll get to dive deeper into what that means. And then there's one more as well that I'll leave as a as a teaser or, you know, right. people can just read the book. <laughs> yes, I love it. So, you know, um, for years, I, I was not a believer, but I wanted to read the Bible. <clears throat> and I read the Bible a few times I would open it up because I had one at home and I would read Genesis 1, Genesis 2, Genesis 3, somewhere in Genesis 4, I think I blanked out. I don't know what happened. But then the next time I wanted to pick up the Bible, I would start all over again because, you know, it's like, I'm going to read this thing. You know, people talk about it. And I would read Genesis 1, Genesis 2, maybe. And it's amazing how many times I read those chapters and didn't realize the richness that they contain. The incredible, massive um, truth that's being told about us, about God, about humanity, and all of our problems. So I love that this book is uh, kind of anchored on that. And so our listeners, as we prepare for this four session podcast series, um, I would highly recommend that you go and read Genesis 1, 2, and 3 again, and that you read it alongside with picking up uh, Sharon's book because I think this will um, we're going to go deeper in this and talk a little bit about it and as I'm I just finished my manuscript and I talk about control in my book as well I'm excited to to ask you some questions about how control 
affects our journey of faith and, and how that, just really honing it in. You talk about control with your children, control in your marriage, all that is super important and we'll, we'll definitely cover that. But I'm very interested in how this habit of control or this, I don't know, is it right to say sin of control? I, um, maybe, <laughs> right? How that affects our journey with God our relationship with God. And, and that, of course, we see in Genesis 3, how that got broken, but then how do we live it today? So mm-hmm. Sharon, I'm so excited to continue this conversation with you. Um, I hope all of you have gotten a taste of her wisdom and her heart, and I cannot wait um, to continue this conversation. Thank you so much. Sounds great. Thank you for listening to Uncharted Podcast with Inez Franklin. Learn more about Inez at unchartedpod.com. Follow Inez's journey on Instagram at Inez Franklin. Sign up for our email list to receive direct access to online experiences and more. Thanks for listening and join us again next time. Mm